Good morning and welcome back to Tanya Live. It's been a while since we uh, have been learning together. Baruch Hashem, my son got married, so, and then it was Shruis. So we were off for two weeks, but it's amazing to be back. And what could be nicer than a glorious day like today? So first of all, I want to welcome everyone. And because I haven't seen you for a while, if you could put down in the chat how you're feeling this morning. This is very different than when we met in November, December. It was getting cold and COVID was so entrenched in our lives. Nobody knew what was happening. Now we already see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I have to tell you, coming from New York... Um, yes, CDC opened everything there, like everything. It is just a different world there, and I know in Canada it will come soon. So lots to look forward to. Good to see everyone joining. Um, just put down in the chat how you're feeling this morning. Just curious what the sentiments are out there before we get into our Tanya. And of course, as you drop things down, I see good morning, Rosalie, Bryna, Kim, Dorit, Clara, Francesca, Becky. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you. And we're excited to get good morning, Corinne. Excited to get going. Um, so, how, okay, how are you feeling this morning? Give me a thumbs up if you are feeling good. A glorious day. We're learning, Tanya. COVID's almost out the door what could be better okay so we're going to start off with chapter 20 good morning arlene yes i missed you too corinne good morning and we'll say to him today i have quite a line a number of people we're going to say to him for feel free to put down names as well yaakov moshe ben necha yehudas basara yitzchak moshe ben rachel reza Tzipora Hinda, Bas Rachel Miriam, Sarah Bas Chana. If you know anyone else who needs uh, Rafua Shalema, we will say Tehillim for them. Good morning, Haley. Thank you. Good morning, Brenda. Good morning, Arlene and Esther. It feels great to be back with you all. Really feels amazing. It feels amazing. I'm so excited that we're back finally. And when the um, sh lockdown is lifted a little bit, women can come back to Shul. Yitzchak ben ben Ra, yeah, Ruth bat Rachel Yitzchak ben Esther Malkaleya. Yes, okay. Besiris time is Barb. Good morning. We have Mordechai Shimon ben Rezel Hilly Basliba. Wow, we have a big list today. Hmm. Good morning, Paula. Okay, chapter Chaf. Good morning, Chana. Okay. and we're saying to Hillem for all those who need a for Shalema, but also for those in Israel, good morning Elaine, for all those in Israel who need extra strength, either to recover from the horrible war they just had, for recovery, a physical, emotional, for all those children that were struggling in shelters that didn't have normal lives for so long, Hashem should give them all a lot of strength and a lot of a lot of hatzlacha. Israel should see tremendous, tremendous hatzlacha. Israel should see God's blessing in such a revealed way that our enemies should be over and done with. The world should see the truth about our enemies. Those who despise us, Hashem should send them just 
an awareness of the truth of how Israel is so com kind and so compassionate and worries so much about the Palestinian civilians that they, they, they cared so much. Hashem should protect us. Listen, we just said Hashem is with us. He guards us. He protects us. We know that he has our back. And the proof is our enemies have come and gone. They're dead. They're dead. They're done. And the Jewish people have still been here, will always be here. So we know that Hashem is, doesn't sleep. Hashem doesn't slumber. He's with us and protecting us. He's our guide, guardian. And, and by the way, we know that one of the ways that Hashem protects his people is when the Jewish people around the world do mitzvahs, give tzedakah, and learn. Learning Torah gives our brethren in Israel the strength that they need. Good morning, Clara. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Elaine. Great to see you all. And we know that the Jewish people are a partnership. In Israel, they're taking care of the logistics. They're taking care of physically protecting their people. What can we do here in Chutz Laaretz? What can we do in the diaspora? We can't go fight. We can't, but what we could do is we could bring more godliness into the world. And like Corinne says, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. We can protect our people right here. So marches are good. And, and unity for Israel is very important because we need the press to, to see who we are, that our Israel support and our protests are peaceful, not like the other side is full of anger and death and, and chanting of horrible things. We are, thank you Hashem, a nation of peace, a nation of kindness, of get, a nation of positive words. You can't compare the two peoples. That's the bottom line. We can't compare who we are, who they are. We have Kedusha in our life that makes us a different people. If you're wondering why our protests and our marches and our vigilance is different, it's because we have an Ashama and we are a people of godliness, of holiness, of goodness. And how do we become that way? Anybody have an idea? How did we become different than those, than our enemies? How are we such a different nation? Put it down in the chats. I'm just curious. How are we so different? Why? We're, we're humans. We all maybe come from, you know, the Middle East, if you want to say. We have Jews in the Middle East. We have the enemies in the Middle East. How are we different? We are different because we have a Torah. Thank you, Corinne. We are different because we have a connection to godliness every single day. We wake up in the morning and we say, yes, we say to Hashem, we have a chelik alukamim al mamish, and we will connect to you, to your essence. And we focus all day with connecting to Hashem's essence. No matter what we do, excellent Kim, we kill with kindness. We are out there constantly giving more to Daka, saying more to Hillam, bringing food to the poor, checking up on our families that just had babies or, or have illnesses. We are out there supporting with kindness and the creator of the world that's his language and he tests us every generation and in every generation we come out on top every single generation we have always come to the top regardless of what's going on around us at the time that the idf is out there what are the jews doing sending tzedakah giving pizza to the to the idf sending money to children, organizations that are helping children. We are nonstop doing mitzvot. And those mitzvahs is what's keeping us going. And as long as we are in Golas, my friends, we are going to have enemies. That is why our crying call right now has to be, we want Mashiach now. Because Mashiach, the era of Mashiach, will bring in the blessing that the lion and the lamb will lie down together. <coughs> this is a powerful, powerful nevuah, a prophecy that has been given to us way back when the time of the prophets. And it says in the days of Mashiach, the lion and the lamb will lay down together. What does that mean? Does it mean if you go to a zoo or you go to a safari, these two animals will lie down? What it means is that the animals, 
the wild animals with the Jewish nation will be in peace. They will put down their guns, their rockets, their bombs, their knives. They will put it down to rest with us, the people of the book, the people of Torah. That's the message of Mashiach. But the question is, do we want Mashiach enough now? Are we requesting Mashiach enough? You know, we're told that there are two ways Mashiach could come. Be'ita or Achishena. Have you ever heard that expression before? Give me a, a thumbs up if you've heard that before. Be'ita, which means Mashiach could come, Be'ita, coming from the root of eight of time, or Achishena, when God can hasten it. In other words, when God created the world, there was a designated time that Mashiach was going to come. The question is, do we have to wait for that? Or the other part of the prophecy is Achishena, that God will hasten the arrival of Mashiach. What can we do to hasten the arrival of Mashiach? That's the question. And so our commentaries and our prophets and, and the Rebbe told us that when the Jew cries out, we want Mashiach now, enough, then we know that Hashem will listen and say, hey, you know, Mashiach's not something I'm just going to give when it's supposed to come. My kids down there are desperate for Mashiach. And how much more so now when we there's so much animosity, so much anger, so much hate. I know we have a challenge today with, with, with social media. We have a challenge with Jews walking in the streets and they're wearing a kippah and, and, and anti-Semites will say something. We have to stay strong. I can tell you right now, my husband hasn't removed his kippah. He hasn't tucked in his tzitzis. He hasn't touched his beard or his black hat. Neither have my children and neither have thousands and thousands of thousands of other Jews. Now is not the time to cower in. Now is not the time to say, I will hide my Judaism because I am scared. We have to put out there a strong stand. Am Yisrael Chai doesn't mean just in our house, screaming, Am Yisrael Chai in our bedroom. Am Yisrael Chai means out there in the public, walking to show proudly, wearing your tzitzis proudly, women looking Jewish proudly, never ever to hide it. And when Hashem sees that strength in us, he protects us and he will do achishena. He will hasten, hasten the coming of Mashiach. So we're your mug and David proudly, beautiful Kareen, and to stand strong. And actually, I, I, I'm not going to ask for it, but one, I need someone to come over to me and ask me if I'm Jewish. Boy, they'll get a mouthful and a fist if needs be as well. But we're learning Tanya today. And as much as we need to speak about our Jewish pride, we know that learning Torah instills with us more Jewish pride, right? The more we connect to our neshama, the more pride we have because we know where we come from, right? So we are up to chapter 50. Excellent delay. Never hire your Judaism. Exactly. We're up to chapter 50. And I, I learned this chapter like for hours because it's a very, very tough chapter. It's a chapter that talks about a term that I might have used many times while we were learning Torah. Tanya, if you know this word, give me a thumbs up. Kalot hanefesh. Uh, maybe Dorit, maybe Becky, you know the word. Kalot hanefesh. When a human being has, a Jew has this feeling of so much fire in your soul. Have you ever heard that expression before? There's so much fire in your soul, you just want to expire and connect to Hashem. My question to you, good morning, Denise. My question to you is, is that the right direction we have to go? Kalos Hanefesh. That we want so much to be connected to Hashem that we want just to leave this world and go up to Hashem. And the question for you now is, is that the right direction a Jew should go. Give me a thumbs up or put down in the comments, do you think that Kalas HaNefesh is the way for a Jew? I'll give you a few minutes to put the comments in and then we'll get on with our class. Okay? 
because Kalos and Nefesh is a real thing. It's ex an expression that's used in Torah, in Judaism, that someone loves Hashem so much. It's like many of you have had children, have children. You remember when there, were, you, um, there was an expression, someone would say, my baby loves me so much, she just wants to curl up back inside my, my womb. Have you ever had that experience? Where you say, oh, my baby just wants to hold on to me so much, she just wants to curl up back in me. And of course, once a child has been born, they could still cuddle up and be part of you, but they can never go back into your womb, right? They've already experienced the world and they are out there for a reason. So what is what does that mean? I want to get back into my mother. I want I love my mom so much, I just want to cuddle up and be with her. I had children like that, that they just wanted to hang around me and hold me and sit in my lap all the time. They just want to be connected, right? You've had that. Share me with, with me an emoji if you've had that before. That, or you have a grandchild that, and I have to tell you. So I was in New York for my son's wedding. And I spent Shabbat with almost all of my grandchildren. And some of my grandchildren just, they just don't go off my lap. Like just wherever I am, they're with me. They hang on to me at the wedding. I, I was looking at pictures, walking down the chuppah. One of my grandchildren walked down the kala with me. It's the best feeling in the world. It's the greatest gift to have these children, grandchildren who just want to be with you and cuddle up into you and hold on to you. And they don't want to let go. And but once a child's born, they have to get out there and they have to spread their wings, right? They have a job. They have a tachlit. They have a tough kid. They have a job. So about being cuddling up into their mother again, into their mother's womb, that's not the essence. A baby was born because they have a mission. And like Sarah says, we need to do down here all that we can to make a place for Hashem. So exactly, Sarah. So it was the point about being born and saying you want to go back to Hashem. There's a passage that says, Al karcha ata chai, al karcha ata mis. Brana says, I think collectively we are lacking fire in the soul. The onset of Zantism has reignited Kalos and Nefesh, maybe. You know, Brana, that's a very interesting thing. Um, we could be lacking fire in the soul, and antisemitism did bring out something, but Kalos and Nefesh is not what they should be bringing out. What they should bring out is connection to Hashem, like Sarah said, making a dear betachtonim, because Kalos and Nefesh means wanting to leave this world, and that's not the point of of Olam Hazen. That's not the point of why God created the world. He wants us to stay down here and make this place a dear betachtonim. And so what you're saying, Brian, is very true. This antisemitism has brought a lot of rejuvenation in a lot of Jews. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't just be a Jew fighting it on social media. I got to do something more. What is that more? What is that I need to do? And that is going back to our neshama, our Torah, our tzedakah, our chassidus, our connecting to Hashem, our mitzvot. If we were a little bit lax in tzedakah, we started doing it now every day. If we were a little lax with lighting Shabbos candle, because, oh, you know, I'll do it once in a while. No, now we got to do it. And we got to do it every single Shabbos. And then have to start putting on tefillin, you know, pull it out of the drawer and put on the tefillin every day. This is what the Rebbe always said. The way we can help the soldiers fight is by us doing the mitzvot here. Um, three weeks ago, before I left New York, there was a march for Israel. And I did a live, a Facebook live, and I wrote there that the girls were giving out neshek. And someone in Israel said, neshek, do you know what that means? Neshek stands for ammunition. And that is true. The the word Neshek also stands for Nerot Shabbat Kodesh. The, wor the girls were giving out Shabbos candles. And the word that we use for Shabbos candles is Neshek. Why Neshek? Because that is the spiritual ammunition. When we light Nerot Shabbat Kodesh here in Canada, we are fortifying our brethren in Israel. 
That's the term for neshek. So the woman on Facebook said to me, oh my God, I got scared. I thought you were giving out neshek. I thought you were giving out ammunition. But what she didn't realize is Jews are not physical beings. And we spoke about this millions of times in our, in our Tanya class. We are spiritual beings in physical bodies. So the neshek that we're talking about was Nero Shabbat Kodesh. That's our spiritual ammunition. And when we light and use our spiritual ammunition here, you know, the Torah also talks about tefillin. It says that when you put on tefillin, the rest of the world, the amim, the nations, will have fear of you. And we know there's stories about this with, with the Six-Day War in Israel, that the, the, the Jews were diving with tefillin and the 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 enemy saw the tefillin and they didn't know what those boxes were. <laughs> they thought it was a new kind of weapon and they ran and they left. And that was our victory. So in a, in a physical sense, they were scared of our, net, of our tefillin. But in reality, the tefillin is what wards off the evil, wards off the enemies. So when men put on tefillin here in Canada and when women Shabbos, light Shabbos candles here in Canada, we are giving the ammunition to our Israeli brethren. And Hannah says, do most of the secular Israelis light Shabbat candles? I don't know if they do it on a regular basis, but I have to tell you, we got rid of 200 Shabbos candles at this pro-Israel thing. Literally within a half hour, we kept saying if we only had another 500, every single Israeli woman that was in her car grabbed a Shabbos candle. It was unbelievable. They wanted more. Every, and then we gave out prayers to say, and they said, give us, give us, give us. They wanted everything. Why? Because a Jew is a neshama. And every Israeli and every Jew is a neshama. So although we might look externally that we are secular, and some Jews might dress secular, they are not. They are the real deal. They are a piece of Hashem. And every single time something threatens our neshama, we fight back. We fight back with neshek of both kinds. So kalas nefesh is a term that means when you want to just leave your body and you want to just return your soul to Hashem. And like we said before, that is not the real experience a Jew has to have in this world. A Jew has to experience living here in this world as a Jew. And we should be taking that yearning and that love that we have for Hashem and very good, Dorit. Hashem didn't like the word because Hashem... Well, the word that the Rebbe didn't like was Jews without a background. Um, I'll get to that story another time. That God said every Jew has a background. Sar Rivka, Rachel, Leah, Avram, Mitzvah, Yaakov is their background. That was um, an experience, um, a dialogue the Rebbe had with George Rohr. But we'll get to that a little bit later. So what is what is what is the this Perik and Tanya talking about this chapter? That we have to realize that when we have a yearning for Hashem that we love, we love Hashem. There are some Jews that, and and I don't know how many we have. I don't know maybe have you met someone like that today in 2021? that has that experience that they love Hashem so much they want to yearn to go back. But there have been generations where Jews actually had that experience. They loved Hashem so much, they just wanted to go back. And that's called Kalas HaNefesh. But really what we have to know is that as much as we might, our Neshama wants to go back, that's not the point of this world. So when I said the 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 expression al karcha atachai val karcha tamis that neshama doesn't and we spoke about this many times right if you remember you can give me the thumbs up we said against your wishes you're born meaning your neshama doesn't want to come down here because your neshama wants to just be close to god but is that the ultimate because your neshama cannot do one mitzvah in Shemayim. Now, one mitzvah, which means the moment a person dies, they're done. They can never do another mitzvah. So living down here in this world is the whole purpose 
of bringing godliness into physicality. Let's repeat that. The whole purpose of living in this world is to bring godliness in your physicality. So, think about all the physical things you have in your life. You have a home. What can you do with your home to make it spiritual? You put mezuzahs on the door. You put tzedakah boxes. By the way, hello. Gidol tzedakah shemikareves is agula. Put your tzedakah in. We put a tzedakah box all over your house. Right? If you notice, this tzedakah box has two holes. It's meant to hang on your wall. I spoke about this a while ago. That the walls of your house should have tzedakah boxes. Not just on your counter. But the wall itself, like it has mezuzahs, it should have a tzedakah box on the wall. This is something that the Rebbe spoke about. Pushing our homes. We have gardens. We have homes. We have cars. What do we need a car for? So that we could bring and do things for Torah, for Hashem. You have a car. Fill it up with people and give them rides. You know, Esther Isaac, you'll remember this. When I grew up, my father had a red Cadillac. That was about one year of my life. He worked um, in his company and he, I guess they all leased cars, the owners or the partners, and he had a red Cadillac. What did he do with his car? He would give people rides every single day. So a typical day would start off like this. I had to go to school, it was 8.15. I would get, come outside, my father would say, Goldula, you're going to school. I'm going to give you a ride. I'd say, no, Ted, it's okay. I'm walking with my friends. He would say, no, 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 I'll give you a ride with your friends. So a few of us would pack into the back seat. Now, my house was 12 minutes from school. Didn't take long to walk. But by the time I got to school with my father, it was always a half hour late. Why? Because <laughs> I'd get into the car, and then we'd go down the street. My father would see, let's say, Mr. Shapiro. He'd say, Mr. Shapiro. Where are you going? He'd say, I'm going up to 770. My father would say, come in the car. I'll give you a ride. So I would hop into the back. Mr. Shapiro would get into the front. He'd continue driving. Two of my friends saw where this is going. They would jump out of the car. My father would continue down the street. He saw Mrs. Lipschitz. Mrs. Lipschitz was walking with six bags. My father would say, Mrs. Lipschitz, where are you going? She'd say, I'm going home. My father would pop up in the trunk. He would say, put your stuff in the car. I'm going to give you a ride home. Mrs. Lipschitz pushed himself into the back seat. We'd keep walking down. Uh, driving down, he would see Rabbi Levy. Rabbi Levy, where are you going? I'm going to this shul. My father would say, get into the car. He would get into the front with the other guy. And we and this is what happened all the way around the neighborhood. <laughs> Just thinking about it now cracks me up. Because it took a while till I would just say, Ty, it's okay. I will walk to school. But this is how we lived our life. My father packed people in the front seat, in the back seat. This is before uh, seatbelts were, were implemented. And he would just keep driving up and down the streets. I was in New York now. Somebody actually stopped me and said, I have to tell you, your father was, um, it was 12 o'clock midnight. My father doesn't sleep very well. So he, he drives up and down the neighborhood to make sure that everyone's safe. He was driving down the street and he sees a lady walking a carriage. My father stops her and he says, why are you out in the street 12 o'clock at night? And she says, because my baby doesn't sleep well, so I live right nearby, so I walk the baby. My father goes, you can't be outside. I'm going to wait for you to go home. I'm going to watch you till you get home. He was the protector. But what, what am I saying now? Is that he had a car. What was the purpose of the car? He didn't need a red Cadillac so that he could show off his car. He had a big, those days the, the Cadillacs were the big ones. He had a car because he would fit people into the car to give people rides. Think about now and put down in the chat, what are some physical things that you have that you share for spiritual reasons, that you share for mitzvahs? You have a house. Do you invite people to sleep in your basement, to sleep people into your in your guest room? Do you have a house? Do you have extra dining room chairs? Do you invite people back into your home when, when, when COVID is over? Do you invite people for Shabbat or is it just your family? That's a big question. Is it just about your family? Because that's not so much about having guests. Having family in your house is partly selfish. I know, because I have my family in my house. That's selfish. But when I have guests in my house, guests, that is when 
and especially guests that no one else invites, you know, the guests that no one wants, those are the people you have to invite in your house. You have cash in your, in your pocket. Give tzedakah. Give extra tzedakah. Not just five cents, but give five dollars, ten dollars. You know, Becky is saying here, a smartphone to watch Tanya Tuesdays. Excellent. You know what else, Becky, we do with a smartphone? How many of us get on Facebook nonstop requests for excellent Hana? That's beautiful. How many of us get nonstop requests for charities? This one needs a heart transplant. This one needs a lung transplant. This one's house got burnt up in flames. And you pull out your credit card and you just give tzedakah. Even if it's just $10 because there are, let's say, 15 charities a day. But you cannot refuse. And just because you don't know the person that, 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 that God forbid, was burnt by a fire. If you get a charity, that's why we have Facebook. That is why we have technology. Thank you for bringing that up, Becky. It's all about what are we doing with technology. So Kalas HaNefesh is not something we do because our Neshama yearns to be Hashem. If, our, if we are down here on this earth, it's because of one thing. Because there's a mission we have to do. And someone said that before. I want to go back to... Um, uh, Dorit says every neshama comes back to fix something within it. That's right. And as long as your neshama is here, that means you have a mission to accomplish and you cannot experience kalot hanefesh. You know, the story, the story is told of four great people, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, and Alicia Ben Avoya. These four great, brilliant Talmudic scholars went to, into something called Pardes. They went into the space of learning Kabbalah that was the highest realm. Pshat, Remesh, Drash, Zom. And, and, and so those four levels, the, the acronym is Pardes, but they went into a very high level of experiencing godliness. Unfortunately, only one came out complete. One of them died then Zoma died, Kalos HaNefesh. Ben Azai became crazy. Alicia Ben Avoyu became a heretic. But Rabbi Kiva came out complete. Why? Why did he go into parties, into the space of total ecstasy, of learning about godliness, of, of almost Kalos HaNefesh? But why did he come down complete? Because he went in with the purpose of coming out. I'm going into study. Kabbalah, Hasidus, whatever, so that I could bring it back into my life. Remember that. We learn Tanya and we learn Hasidus for one purpose. Because we need to make it practical into our life. How are we going to make this poil mamish into my life? I know I love Hashem. Yes, I love Hashem so much. I wish I could move back up to Hashem and be there. Because I love Torah. I love becoming with one's essence. But that's not the point of the world. The point of this world is to experience and live godliness, to live Hashem practically in this world. There's another expression, and I like to give you these Hasidic and Kabbalic, Kabbalistic expressions because it's good to have on your fingertips. There's Ratzoi Vishov, the idea of I want to become close to again, my desire to be to Hashem, but Shuv, I have to come back here and be practical in this world. I need to make this world a place for godliness, not to experience Kalos and Nefesh where I want to go back up to Hashem, but as long as I'm here, I need to bring it back down. You know, there's a beautiful song that the Rebbe taught his Hasidim. Tzamalecha nafshi kamalecha b'sari what does it mean? Samal Khanafshi, my 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 nefesh, my my soul desires you. It thirsts for you. I want to be one with you. And many Rebbe's have sung the song and, and many Khasidim will sing the song when you want to become close to Hashem. And that's beautiful, you know. Shabbat I spent with um, a beautiful Shabbos in New York. And one of the beautiful things that we did was we had, before Shabbat was over, we did something called Seder Hanigunim. 
Have you experienced this? Anybody know what Seda Nagunim is? Give me a thumbs up if you heard of it or put it in the chat if you haven't. Seda Nagunim is the most incredible thing. It's before, we, well, we did it bef- between Mincha and Mayrev. You can eat at that point before Shabbos is over. You're waiting for Shabbat so you could do Havdalah. We sat down together, me, my, my siblings, my, my, my daughter-in-law, her siblings, and we did Seder Nugunim. We sat and sang all the songs of the Rebbes. And then we sang all the songs from Tehillim and all the beautiful songs that are out there today. You know, the great Jewish singers out there. And I sat with teenagers, 30 teenagers, beautiful, gorgeous Jewish teenagers. And I know Kim, Kim Jen is ex- going to experience that this year, musician. We sang Seder Nugunim. And literally the girls were feeling this love to Hashem. It was so powerful. It was so beautiful. All sitting together, all generation, little girls, teenagers, university girls, married women, grandmothers, all Jewish women singing together. And in the other part of the area were the men having their Seydin Agonim. You know, at that point, I understood what it meant to become one with Hashem. You were just singing for an hour, becoming close to Hashem. But after we finished Seyed Nagunim, we made Havdalah, we looked at the candle, we smelled the besamim, the spices, and we went on with our Malava Malka and experiencing doing mitzvahs. Because it's not just about your ecstasy in spirituality, but it's about becoming close to Hashem, bringing it down to the world, and making your love for Hashem practical. So the bottom line of this parak is like this talks about loving Hashem so much that you want to become closer and you might want to experience like Reb, Reb, the some of the great rabbis was that they, they, they experience ecstasy but their body their souls left their body we don't want that we are living in a world where we have to bring godliness down into this world and I just want to read to you what the Tanya says in this chapter so it says here the strongest love of God come, that you have comes from the fire in your soul. It's a desire to leave your body and to be one with your maker. This love won't actually inspire you to observe the Torah, but the rebound emotion of recalling your divinely allotted purpose in life will. So when you know that you love Hashem and you want to leave your body, that's not going to make you closer to Hashem. What will inspire you to observe the Torah? It's the rebound of the emotion. When you get excited about Hashem and Hashem who gave you life and Hashem who created the world, He gives you the beautiful sunshine, He gives you a comfortable house, He gives you a heart and eyes and you're able to wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you open your Siddur and you read the brachas and you read, you know, the the blessings that Hashem, that you gave me back my... um, all the parts of my body that work and Hashem thank you for giving me understanding to distinguish between day and night thank you for opening the eyes of the blind or straightening the bowed or clothing the naked give strength to the weary spreads forth the earth above the waters you direct the step of man you provide me with my every need you gird the people of Israel with might I mean these are blessings that every woman who's watching this you have to say it every morning like how could we we even learn Tanya if we didn't dive in, in the morning. We ask Hashem to help us to study Torah and to cleave on to your commandments. And we do say to Hashem, do not bring us unto sin, nor into transgression or iniquity or in temptation. We know we're going to have a day that's physical and a day that's going to make us want to say a little lush and horror or a day that's going to make us want to do something that's night. So we say to Hashem, you know, give me the strength to really, really be godly today. My Nisham is not going to have Kalas and Nefesh. I'm not leaving the world. But down here, I want to be connected to you, God, throughout the day. And you know what's a good thing to do? Tonight, before you go to sleep, right before you say Shema, take down a, pa- a paper, get a piece of paper, and write down all the mitzvahs you did today. And it could be cooking for your family, making a kosher meal, making the blessing, even going shopping for your family. That's a mitzvah. You know, because as the Karis of Ayas, we're doing these things. We are connecting our families and being connected 
through mundane things. That's who we are. We're physical beings and doing mundane things to bring godliness. So I want to wish you all a wonderful week. A week full of bringing Hashem down into the world. Having a, a week full of godliness, spirituality, and sending our love, our strength, our mitzvahs to the people of Israel, to everybody out there who might be struggling with anti-Semitism. We don't have to worry about that. Hashem is going to fight our wars. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.